healthy breathing is in and out through the nose, driven by the diaphragm. It's light, it's quiet, and it's gently paused on the exhale. It's regular, and it's effortless. So that's what healthy breathing looks like. Unhealthy breathing is the same breathing as we do when we get stressed. It's slightly faster, it's irregular, we sigh, the amplitude of each breath is a little bit bigger, there's no natural pauses between breaths, it's upper chest, it's through the mouth, and it requires effort. Many people know how we breathe when we get stressed, but how about if you were breathing like that all of the time? And many people breathe like that all of the time, and that is going to keep the body in that state of stress. It's not just that stress changes your breathing, it's that your breathing will also change your stress. Mm. So in order to bring the body into relaxation, we need to do the exact opposite to the stress response. Instead of breathing faster, we really need to slow down the breath, to quieten the breath, to calm the breath. Instead of breathing through the mouth, we need to breathe through the nose. Instead of having irregular breathing, we want to achieve regular breathing. Instead of breathing using the chest, we want to breathe using the diaphragm. And instead of having effortful breathing, we want to have effortless breathing. So with breathing, less is more, and breathing can be changed. Hey, this is Ari. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. This episode is something unique. This is actually an episode that I recorded several years ago, and I decided to re-release it because it's one of the most important episodes that I've ever done, and uh, for one other reason. So uh, I'll get to that in a minute. So this episode is with Patrick McCowan, who is one of the world's top experts in the science of breathing and how breathing relates to human health and energy. After this episode, Patrick and I became friends. And a couple years later, maybe two or three years after I originally recorded this, uh, I asked Patrick to partner with me on creating a breathing program, Breathing for Energy. And that's the name of the program that we co-created together. And it is an absolutely phenomenal program. It's become my best-selling program. And it has transformed the lives. And I, I don't say that lightly. It's genuinely transformed the lives of thousands of people. And in particular, there are three tracks to this program. So we created three separate tracks with different breathing exercises and a systematic progressive breathing program for three different groups of people, actually four uh, technically, but three individual tracks and then one sort of central program that everybody moves to after the individual track. So one is for people dealing with stress and anxiety issues. One is for people dealing with chronic sleep issues, insomnia, even uh, breathing issues at night, and even things like, to some degree, uh, sleep apnea issues can be resolved very effectively, depending on the type of sleep apnea you have, can be uh, resolved or at least helped tremendously from these different exercises. So one for stress and anxiety, one for sleep, one for people dealing with chronic fatigue issues and burnout issues, low energy issues. And then after each of those individual tracks that you might wanna do, there's a central track uh, for people who are generally well, already well, who are looking to optimize performance. And there are two key levers that this program is really designed for. One is for increasing energy levels and the other one is for combating anxiety. Uh, and there's some really fascinating science of how our breathing and especially our CO2 tolerance in the brain is related to our stress and fear processing centers. And so how our breathing actually, and, and the uh, levels of blood gases, uh, oxygen, but to a large extent, CO2 influence uh, our baseline levels of stress and anxiety. So how altering our breathing can really massively move the needle uh, for people dealing with chronic anxiety issues. Um, the other thing is how do we alter levels of blood gases in a way that delivers oxygen more effectively to the cell? So how do we alter our breathing to actually change what are called the partial pressures of oxygen and CO2 so we can actually end up delivering oxygen more effectively to our tissues. This relates to a concept in physiology called the Bohr effect, 
which is something we'll talk about in this podcast episode and something we talk at great length about in the actual Breathing for Energy program. So with no further ado, let's get into this episode. There's a link below this if you're interested in learning with Patrick and with me to optimize your breathing for energy and for decreased stress and anxiety. That program is called Breathing for Energy. The link is down below, or you can go to the energyblueprint.com, click on programs, and you'll find it there. So with no further ado, enjoy this wonderful podcast with world-renowned breathing expert, Patrick McCowan. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Great. No, thanks very much, Ari. Delighted to talk. Great. So first, uh, I kind of want to start off with general context. Why Mm -hmm. should we be concerned at all with kind of consciously breathing in a certain way or doing breathing practices? Because, you know, I guess on a fundamental level, our, our breathing is supposed to be unconsciously regulated by our brain. So I guess we can start there. Why should we be concerned with breathing at all? Well, I think... You know, 500 years ago, even maybe 100 years ago, our breathing would have been pretty good. We were living more, you know, akin to having good breathing patterns. We weren't sitting down at desks. We weren't stressed as much. Um, The stresses that we had were different. They weren't that long-term kind of financial pressures that many people were exposed to. Our jobs were very industrial-based or required physical movement. Nowadays, they're very sedentary, and add to that, then we're talking a lot. All of these factors change breathing. Mm. Posture, excessive talking, uh, stuffy environments, stress levels, and lack of physical exercise. So our breathing, even though it's an involuntary activity, it's also subject to change. And when our breathing changes, many other functions of the human body can change. So it's through our breath that we can influence positively or negatively, different functions of the body. So I think it's important to recognize the effect that modern life has on breathing and also what we can do to change breathing. Excellent. So we have a certain set point, I would imagine, as far as where our brain tends to regulate, you know, oxygen and carbon dioxide. And we're we're going to get into more detail around that later, but just to kind of wrap up this initial idea um, that the way that our brain tends to regulate breathing patterns at us in a certain way, can yes. change as influenced by some of these factors that you just mentioned. Yes, Stephen Demeter in a paper, Asthma and Hyperventilation, he said all it takes is 24 hours. 24 hours of excessive breathing will reset the breathing center towards more excessive breathing. Oh. I'm not saying that your breathing will completely change in 24 hours, but 24 hours can all it can take to start the process. Now, you can imagine somebody who's been prone to three months of stress or their job involves talking, and they're talking at a call center for six or eight hours per day. All of that is changing breathing, and that's long-term changes to breath. So, yeah, it's like the theory behind it is that you habituate to a larger breathing volume, and that's based on the low set point of carbon dioxide. So basically the body, an event causes the body to breathe more, the body breathes more, a biochemical change takes place, Carbon dioxide is initially lost as a result of overbreathing, but then the kidneys dump bicarbonate to maintain, to bring pH back to normal, and that's when there's a more permanent change. So now you're left with low end tidal CO2 and reduced buffer. Very interesting. So talk to me about the oxygen paradox. So why, why is it a paradox? And, and I know there's a lot of misconceptions as far as common lay public beliefs around oxygen and carbon dioxide. So can you talk a bit about what those, those misconceptions are? Yeah, probably the biggest one is take a deep breath, you know, and um, the instruction to take a deep breath. And the next thing is you see this big breath or this fast breath, heavy breath often through the mouth. The instruction to take a deep breath is correct, but the interpretation of taking a deep breath is incorrect. If you breathe through your nose, you will activate the diaphragm. The word deep means far from the top. So nose breathing automatically activates the diaphragm. So nose breathing does bring the air deeper into the lungs. If you look at the shape of the lungs, they're triangular, and the greatest concentration of blood is in the lower lobes. Whereas if you're breathing through the the mouth, you'll tend to use the upper part of the lungs. All you have to do is look down at your chest, take a breath through the mouth, and see what part of the body moves. It's the chest. Now back to the lungs. 
the greatest the greatest <laughs> the greatest amount of blood is in the lower lobes and the greatest amount of air is coming into the upper if you mouth breathe so there's a ventilation perfusion mismatch here so basically what we need to do is we breathe through the nose to bring the air from the top part of the lung down into the lower and by breathing through your nose you pick up a gas called nitric oxide and nitric oxide redistributes the blood from the lower lobes of the lungs up to the upper so that's why a better gas exchange takes place Nose breathing improves arterial oxygen uptake by about 10 to 20%. So nose breathing improves oxygenation of the blood. Mouth breathing, of course, is going to reduce it. Now, you're talking about the, the oxygen paradox. The harder you breathe, the less oxygen that's delivered to the cells. In order for oxygen to be delivered to the cells, you need carbon dioxide. If you breathe too hard, you offload CO2, you lose it from the lungs, you reduce it in the blood through the lungs. The loss of carbon dioxide in the blood will cause blood vessels to constrict. The harder you breathe, the more the blood vessels constrict and the greater the bond between oxygen and the red blood cells. In other words, the hemoglobin, the red blood cells will hold on to oxygen when there's a reduced pressure of carbon dioxide. So ultimately, it's your breathing which determines the pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood. You need optimum amount of CO2 and you need optimum amount of CO2 to allow the oxygen to be released from the red blood cells to the cells. Yeah, let, let's stop there because I think it's worth digging into that point more because it's so counter to what most people are operating sure. in. You know, most people think of, of carbon dioxide, of CO2, as just a waste product. And yes. we breathe in oxygen, we exhale carbon dioxide, it's just the waste product. So yes. what, what you're saying there, for, for people who are not already familiar with this, you're saying that CO2 is way more than just a waste product, but actually Absolutely. serves a, a very, very vital and important function, which is... Yes, yes. A number of functions. One is carbon dioxide helps open up the blood vessels. Um, it's, it's a vasodilator. Carbon dioxide also plays a role in opening the airways, both the upper and the lower. You can open up your nose by increasing CO2. You also help open up your lungs, it's a bronchodilator, by increasing CO2. And also you assist with the release of oxygen from the red blood cells by increasing CO2. Another factor is they looked at the brain of rats. If you depress carbon dioxide, brain cells become more hyperexcitability. If you increase carbon dioxide, brain cell is calming effect. In other words, that the brain can regulate its own excitability through the breath. So, we can't just say that yes, oxygen is good and carbon dioxide is bad. In order to properly really harness oxygen and to utilize oxygen, we need carbon dioxide. It is true that the body breathes to get rid of excess CO2. There's such a surplus of oxygen in the human body. During rest, we exhale up to 75% of our intake of oxygen. During physical exercise, we exhale up to 25% of our intake of oxygen. The body has plenty of oxygen. The problem is not that the body doesn't have ox enough oxygen in the blood. The problem is getting the oxygen from the blood to where it's needed, to the cells. So is uh, these problems that you're talking about, are these, something, are these things that can be picked up with a pulse oximeter? If somebody just says, oh, you know, do I actually have oxygenation problems? I'm going to put yes. on this pulse oximeter. Will that detect the kind of problem that you're, that you're referring to? Most people, when they put it, use a pulse oximetry, which is measuring the peripheral oxygenation of the blood um, most people will have normal okay you will have people with copd with or with severe asthma they've got a poor gas exchange taking place in the lungs because of damaged airways the oxygen can't get from the lungs to the blood so they'll show lower spo2 we see many many people with stress many people with fatigue panic attack brain fog all of these can be changed and improved by their breathing by changing their breathing but their SpO2 is normal. They have plenty of oxygen in the blood, but it's not getting, the oxygen isn't getting from the blood to the cells. We need to get the oxygen from the blood to the cells, and we get the oxygen from the blood to the cells in the presence of carbon dioxide. Don't breathe too hard to get rid of too much CO2, because then the blood isn't going to release the oxygen to the cells so readily. Okay, so CO2 is vital for oxygen delivery to the cells, not necessarily yes. oxygen saturation in the blood, but the ability of those yes. red blood cells to drop off oxygen to the, to the cells. Correct. So when, what you're saying is when people are over breathing, they're altering the CO2 levels in their blood in a way that leads to less efficient oxygen delivery. 
So, exactly. So let's dig into that, that over breathing concept a little bit more. So what, what is this all about? And I guess you're saying that, you know, all those factors you mentioned initially stress and, and sitting sedentary jobs and, and so yes. on alters breathing dynamics in a way that changes carbon dioxide levels in the blood and yes. oxygen delivery. So what, what exactly does over breathing look like and what does, what do healthy, optimal breathing patterns look like? Sure. Um, healthy breathing is in the nose, the nose, driven by the diaphragm. It's light, it's quiet, and it's gently paused on the exhale. It's regular, and it's effortless. So that's what healthy breathing looks like. Unhealthy breathing is the same breathing as we do when we get stressed. It's slightly faster. It's irregular. We sigh. The amplitude of each breath is a little bit bigger. There's no natural pauses between breaths. It's upper chest, it's through the mouth, and it requires effort. Many people know how we breathe when we get stressed. But how about if you were breathing like that all of the time? And many people breathe like that all of the time. And that is going to keep the body in that state of stress. It's not just that stress changes your breathing. It's that your breathing will also change your stress. So in order to bring the body into relaxation, we need to do the exact opposite to the stress response. Instead of breathing faster, we really need to slow down the breath, to quieten the breath, to calm the breath. Instead of breathing through the mouth, we need to breathe through the nose. Instead of having irregular breathing, we want to achieve regular breathing. Instead of breathing using the chest, we want to breathe using the diaphragm. And instead of having effortful breathing, we want to have effortless breathing so with breathing less is more and breathing can be changed beautiful do we have uh, like a reference for comparison uh, as as far as either athletes or or really really healthy people that we can clearly see these people are, are breathing in a different pattern than maybe unhealthier yes. people and and what does that look like what are those differences um on a very simple level if you were walking down the street and you see somebody who's, who's more obese, you'll see, and you'll often notice that they have labored breathing. Of course, now their breathing is going to be a bit heavier because they've got greater metabolic need and they're carrying more weight and have to carry that. But anytime you see heavy breathing, it's not a good sign of health. If you look at an athlete, an athlete will have light breathing. Not all athletes. Some athletes too have poor breathing habits and they have the determination and the willpower to push themselves through. However, it can be very counterproductive for that athlete. Mm. So even though we often expect, like what I say to people is, physical exercise isn't the gateway to good breathing, but good breathing is the gateway to good physical exercise. Because if you're breathing optimal during the day, you're going to breathe optimal during physical exercise. You can't expect your breathing to be off during the day and for it to suddenly fix itself during physical exercise. That's not going to happen. So we use a measurement. There's a few things I look at when I'm looking at somebody. I look at the amplitude of the breath. Now, I don't stare at it. I just get an idea of it. You get a feel for, for a person coming in. And I look at the amplitude. I look at the respiratory rate. I look at the regularity. I look at the natural pause between breaths. And I also measure their bolt score. And their bolt score is basically how long the individual can hold their breath comfortably following an exhalation. In other words, if you take a normal breath into your nose, a normal breath out, and you pinch your nose, at some point during that breath hold, the brain is going to send a message to breathe. That's the bolt score. It's the first reaction of the body to take a breath. It's the first distinct desire to take a breath. And the lower the bolt score, the greater the onset and the degree of breathlessness during physical exercise. So that's, that's kind of the endurance of breathlessness during physical exercise. And then I've got a measurement of the upper limit of tolerance of physical exercise. So that's the steps score, or in the book we use, it's the nose unblocking exercise. So we have the individual breathe in through their nose, breathe out through their nose, and pinch their nose, and we count how many paces they can hold their breath for. Mm -hmm. The objective is to be able to walk 80 to 100 paces holding the breath after an exhalation. Now I know a lot of people will feel that sounds too, mu too much, but you build yourself up to it. Generally though, a really good athlete, if I had a top-class MMA fighter, generally off the bat, their bolt score is about 25 to 30 seconds, and the upper tolerance of their breathlessness is about 60 to 70 steps. Mm -hmm. So that's a good starting point. 
And what we want to do is we want to bring all athletes to that point, but we want to get them beyond it. Um, because you can improve both your aerobic capacity and also you can improve your anaerobic capacity by doing a series of exercises designed to reset the breathing center in the brain. And like Gary, in a way it makes sense. Athletes will train every part of the body. They train their mind, they go to a nutritionist, they have all of these different disciplines to help them. But yet often the, their breathing is the limiting factor. It's their breathing that's holding them back, but nobody is looking at how the athletes are breathing. And it's their everyday breathing that's setting the limits during their physical exercise. You have to train your everyday breathing. Breathing isn't just that thing that's an involuntary activity. We have voluntary control over it, and we need to know what constitutes good breathing. Yeah, I, I have to say that after practicing the, the steps exercise, the, the, the pacing yes. exercise with breath holds, that yep. literally within, it's, it's by far the most powerful breathing exercise that I've ever yes. done. And uh, within two or three weeks, I actually noticed huge improvements in, you know, in the gym when I was working out, lifting weights. Yes. Uh, as far as my work capacity, as far as at what point in the workout did I really feel like I started to get run down? And yes. as far as the rest between exercise, all, all of a sudden I was able to take much less stress. I was recovering much quicker after each bout mm -hmm. of exercise and I could do much more work in a workout uh, before actually feeling like I was tired. Yes. And yeah. uh, I, mean, I mean, really noticeable, big noticeable improvements within two or three weeks of practicing this. So yeah. it's, this stuff yeah. is powerful for sure. Yeah, no, it's a very interesting exercise. That exercise alone, you can open up the nose. It makes you feel more alert. Mm -hmm. It adds an extra load onto the breathing muscles. It strengthens the diaphragm. You know, 50% of athletes can be prone to diaphragmatic fatigue. Mm -hmm. If the diaphragm gets tired, blood is stolen from the legs. So if you see somebody with jelly legs, and some of your listeners would have been watching the, the, the Mayweather Conor, Conor McGregor fight there a few weeks back, <laughs> yeah. um, you see it on the, on the seventh round, the commentator said, the commentator makes a point, McGregor is sucking air through his mouth towards the end of the seventh round. Yeah. And the commentator is noticing that his breathing is getting that bit heavier. And then in the tenth round, the legs go jelly. Yeah. Now the legs go jelly, it could have been due to two things. A buildup of hydrogen ions and, you know increased anaerobic activity that the muscles of the legs weren't getting enough oxygen and hydrogen ion wasn't getting oxidized so fatigue set in the legs that could be one aspect but the second aspect could have been diaphragmatic fatigue mm -hmm. that the diaphragm was getting tired and as a result blood now is diverted from the legs to feed the diaphragm so it could be a combination but both of those things can be improved and from the exercise that you were talking about the nose unblocking exercise that also works to help with that too. Yeah, McGregor should have been working with you. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? A lot of athletes, they need to hear of this from a few different modalities. Mm -hmm. um, but we've worked with some brilliant athletes. And we've worked with some MMA, really good MMA fighters. So the word is getting out there, you know, slowly but surely. I think breathing is one of those things that was kind of hippies that were mainly do it and guys with open right. sandal brigades and tree huggers <laughs> but now when you start looking at you know when you break down what you can do with the breath there's an advantage in it yeah so let's go a little deeper into this this bolt score and uh you yes. know just make it really practical for people to to do this for themselves because it can be done in in you know what less than a minute and, yes uh, and you can get a bolt score and just kind of tell people what that means and where they you know, maybe what a good or, or not so good starting point is and where they want to get to. Sure. If, a, if an individual has got respiratory complaints, if they've got asthma, if they're very panicky or anxiety, they tend to have a bolt score of between 5 and 15 seconds. If an individual is a recreational athlete and they're pushing themselves a little bit, but they have poor breathing habits, I often see a bolt score between 15 and 25 seconds. If the individual is a very good athlete and they still have, you know, their breathing can be prone to improvements, um, they will be 25 seconds plus. The goal is 40 seconds. And there was a book, it's published in North America, it's Nutrition and Physical Performance. It's by an author called William McArdle. And he said if an athlete exhales, they should be able to hold their breath for 40 seconds before the urge to initiate inspiration resumes. Mm. In other words, they can breathe in, a normal breath in, normal breath out, hold their breath for a period of 40 seconds 
And when they resume breathing at 40 seconds, their breath is fairly normal. Mm. That's good breathing. Yeah. And I've only seen out of seven and a half thousand people, I've only seen two individuals who presented with a 40 second bolt time. One was a free diver. And the second was, she's world champion in Qigong. Basically, she's a master of martial arts. And she's got eight black belts. She had a 40 second control pause off the bat. And I was talking to her about the breathing exercise. I wrote her about her in the book. Her name is Master Jennifer Lee. Mm-hmm. And we were discussing, you know, how did she get her control pause? Because, of course, she's living in Germany and she's exposed to the same stress that everybody else is. She was saying that the discipline was passed down from generation to generation. But obviously, as it was passed down, it wasn't getting distorted. So her discipline is Tai Chi. Um, but oftentimes we see in various disciplines that the information as it gets passed down through the ranks or through the, through the generations, the, the information gets lost. And I think that's what's after happening in yoga. And that's what's after happening in a lot of the Eastern modalities. But if you go back to the core of these traditions, the two things that they emphasize is that your breathing should be subtle and that it shouldn't be hard. Well, if your breathing is subtle, you will have a high bolt time. If your breathing is hard during rest, you have a low bolt time and you're more likely to get breathless during exercise. Mm. Great. So as far as where people want to get to, we're looking upwards of at least 25 seconds, 30 seconds. Yes. Yes. It's ideal. Like people will feel better if every time the bolt score increases by five seconds. Now just measuring your bolt score isn't going to increase it. Right. In order to increase your bolt score, you need to breathe through your nose day and night. I would say that do most of your physical exercise with your mouth closed. If you're a really competitive athlete, do 50% of your exercise with your mouth closed and 50% with your mouth open. The mm. mouth closed will add an extra load onto the breathing muscles and the mouth open will allow you to maintain 100% of your workload so for muscle conditioning. So that's only for competitive athletes. The other thing is to practice various exercises to reset the breathing center in the brain. And also we need to breathe through the nose during sleep. If you wake up with a dry mouth in the morning, you're breathing through your mouth during sleep, you're more likely to be fatigued but you've spent six to eight hours breathing hard. Well, that's going to reset the, the respiratory center in the wrong direction. Excellent. So, you know, you, there's, there's a few things I want to talk about that are wrapped up in what you just said. Um, one, you, you talked about fatigue just now. My audience, yes. you know, is really all about energy and fatigue. And I'm, I'm wondering yes. if you have any experience working with people who have chronic fatigue syndrome or, or yes. who are burned out and and what your experience has been after implementing some of these breathing methods. Yes. Um, When we work with people with chronic fatigue, it depends on the severity of the fatigue. If they are very, very severely fatigued, I found that the exercises can add too much of a load onto them. Um, So it's difficult for me then to get them to that point whereby we can make progress. However, If they're able to do exercises, I start anybody on with chronic fatigue, I start them off with breath hold exercise, breathing recovery that's in the book. And a breathing recovery is simply hold your breath for five, breathe for 10. So breathe into your nose, breathe out through your nose, pinch your nose, hold it for a count of five. One, two, three, four, five. Let go and resume breathing for about 10 seconds. And hold for five and resume breathing. I want the person with chronic fatigue to build their control pause up to a certain foundation. Once I get their breathing under more control, with a higher, sorry, bolt time or control pause, once I get their breathing up to a better level, then we start doing the stronger exercises. We do the nose unblocking exercise. I actually believe it's the nose unblocking exercise that's getting a far better route for chronic fatigue. Mm. And my theory is this. It's driving the body into a sympathetic activation. And by stressing the body out slightly, the body is making adaptations and the body then is fighting the fatigue on the back of it. So the best results that I've seen were the reduced breathing is a brilliant exercise. The breathe light exercise is brilliant exercise. But the one thing that I noticed with chronic fatigue is we have to push the people. But I don't want to push them too soon at the start because it pushes them back. So that's why we go very easy for a few weeks to get them adjusted to nose breathing, to get some progress with their breathing. And then when they make some progress with their breathing, then I start pushing them because their body is better. And the the more strength they get, 
the better they're able to do the exercise which feeds back into it. Sleep is very important. They cannot have the mouth open during sleep. If you have your mouth open during sleep, it's exhausting. To yeah, the system. I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because this is this is that was my next question wrapped up in what you were saying. So, so how does one control that? Obviously, when you're sleeping, uh, you're not sitting there being conscious of how you're breathing. You're asleep. Yes. So, of course, how, how do you get around? Relax. That? Um, we should be looking at position as well. Don't sleep in the back. If you sleep in the back, the tongue is more likely to go into the airway. It can increase the risk of obstructive sleep apnea. That's when we stop breathing during sleep. Um, so I want people sleeping on their side or on the front. And it would be ideal for them to wear some form of, it's a paper tape that we use. Um, you know, and the paper tape, I know it sounds a bit kind of shocking when people hear of it first, but wear it for about 15 to 20 minutes during the day. Get used to it. The just, normal just, mode of breathing just, is breathe through the nose. Sorry to interrupt. Just to clarify right. what, what you're saying, because it might not be clear to people. You're saying tape the mouth shut. Yes. Now, it's not by using duct tape or insulation tape or construction grade tape. We would use a medically based tape. Mm -hmm. um, there's even a new tape now that's come out of the United States, which is brilliant. It was developed by a dentist in Colorado called Dr. Frank Seaman. And he noticed that his patients coming in, a lot of them had bruxism or grinding of the teeth. So he'd fit crowns. He would do lovely dental work. And the next thing is they'd be coming back in a few months later and the dental work has, has been disrupted as a result of clenching of, the, of the, the jaws and grinding of the teeth. So he found it was specifically mouth breathing that was contributing to this because mouth breathing was affecting the activation of breathing during sleep and it was changing the positioning of the jaws and it was increasing the likelihood of bruxism. So he started taping. So he developed a tape called lip seal tape it's a great little tape. It's nice and easy to wear. So if, for instance, you know, probably the biggest scare that people have is I can't tape up my mouth because my nose gets blocked. Mm. But your nose only gets blocked if you breathe through your mouth. It only gets blocked fully if you breathe through your mouth. Mm. If you continue breathing through the nose, the nose opens up. And it's just as important to breathe out through the nose as it is to breathe in. Because if you breathe out through your nose, your nose captures the moisture and heat on the exhale breath. And it's the capturing of the moisture and heat that actually opens up the nose. So the difference between sleep, we looked at studies. And they have a number of studies whereby they had individuals breathe through their nose one night and breathe through their mouth another night. The, the night that they breathe through the nose, the subjects had deeper sleep they woke up more rested, and they had less obstructive sleep apnea, etc. Subjectively and objectively, they felt better. Then they had those same individuals breathe through an open mouth during sleep. One individual out of eight developed obstructive sleep apnea, merely just on the basis of open mouth breathing. They felt worse when they woke up, and also objectively, when they looked at, they spent more time in light sleep. Deep sleep is very important for repair of the human body. And we're all aware of, you know, the lymphatic system in terms of the body's natural kind of sewage waste disposal system to get rid of waste from the body. But in the brain, there's what's called the glymphatic system. And that's when the waste is mopped up, that the brain kind of, if I use the word, repairs itself or cleanses itself or restores itself. But it only happens during very deep sleep. So deep sleep is vitally important. I think for chronic fatigue, I think, I think it's really important to get sleep right. And it's not just the quantity of sleep. We have to be thinking of the quality. Now, insomnia, which can affect quite a number of people, which will lead to fatigue during the day, that can be helped significantly by really slowing down your breath and slowing down your breathing to the point that you get a slight air hunger and maintaining that slow breathing for 15 to 20 minutes before you go to sleep. We need to switch off. You can't just be go, 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 go all day. And the next thing is you need to switch, you know, you can't go from a state of constantly going, 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 and then expect to go into deep sleep. It's not going to happen. And what's worse, what do people do to relax? They look at their iPads, they stare into their mobile phones, they, they, they scroll through Facebook and all of the modern technology is sending a blue light 
that's reducing melatonin of the brain and it's keeping the brain in that awake sleep, in awake state, so they don't even get down to a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. No blue light technology, very dark room, good circulation of air, don't sleep in the back, don't drink alcohol or eat food late at night and breathe through your nose. But more importantly, if you reduce your breathing for 15 to 20 minutes before you go to sleep, by really slowing down your breath, you'll activate that parasympathetic response, that relaxation response, and you'll have a deeper sleep. So what, is, what does that look like uh, as far as slowing down the breath? Can you, can you kind of demonstrate or make this very practical for people maybe who, who don't really understand what that means? Sure. So basically, people follow their breathing. They follow their breath and airflow as it comes into their nose and out to the nose. And they follow maybe the slightly colder air as it comes in, the slightly warmer air as it leaves. And they pay attention to their breathing. They could put one hand on their chest and one hand just above their diaphragm. And they could apply gentle pressure. And the whole objective is to really slow down your breathing to the point that you feel a need for air. So you need to slow down your breath by about 30%. In other words, instead of taking, say, the breath in like that and the breath out, that you completely slow it down. But by slowing it down, you don't make the amplitude bigger. And you slow it down. You don't hold your breath. You don't freeze your breathing. You don't tense up your breathing muscles. You focus on the airflow coming in and out of the nose. And you intentionally slow down the speed of the air as it enters and leaves your nostrils. And by slowing down the speed of the air as it enters and leaves your nostrils, carbon dioxide builds up in the blood. As carbon dioxide builds up, the blood vessels dilate. More oxygen gets released from the blood to the cells. You, you experience increased watery saliva in the mouth and you get drowsy. You activate the relaxation response, you improve your blood circulation, and you open up your airways by slowing down your breath. And what's more, it's the absolute opposite that is commonly taught in Pilates, Western yoga, and by stress counselors. Mm. Explain what you mean way, by that. What, what, is, what do they commonly teach? They're commonly teaching and any time when I've sat in, you know, I've sat in, I'm, this is not a, a criticism. This is just an awareness. If you go to a yoga studio, you should never hear people breathing during rest. You should never hear people increasing their breathing or taking more air in. Because to get true benefits from the breath, we should be doing the opposite. Meditation has been used by, for two and a half thousand years to activate that relaxation response. Stress makes people sick, and on the basis that stress makes people sick, relaxation helps to make them better. When we go into that relaxation response, our breath diminishes and diminishes and diminishes. We're not taking harder breathing. The whole purpose of meditation is to diminish the breath. Mm -hmm. That's where you get the benefits. What I'm saying is just go straight into it. Deliberately start diminishing your breath. You'll naturally activate the relaxation response and you naturally will open up your blood vessels and airways. When we get stressed, the mouth goes dry. A dry mouth is activation of the sympathetic response. Increased watery saliva in the mouth happens as a result of meditation, but it also happens when you do reduce breathing. A lot of people find that it can be frustrating to meditate because the mind is scattering all over the place. It's a lot easier to reduce your breath, and by reducing your breath, you're focusing on the breath, and when you're focusing on the breath to get air hunger, the mind is more anchored on the breath. So you're getting a meditation, but you're also activating the physiological aspect of relaxation. We know that when you do controlled slow breathing, it dampens the sympathetic response and it promotes the parasympathetic response. And systems who, which are disturbed by stress can be repaired through slow, quiet, gentle, soft breathing. There's a saying from yoga, and I'm talking about yoga from maybe hundreds of years ago, that your breathing should be so light that the fine hairs within the nostrils do not move. Breathing should be subtle. That's what the original sutras of yoga said. Not hard, how it's commonly described today. So if you're in your yoga and you're doing your, ever, your postures, the main thing is don't hear your breathing. As Chris Pei said, Beginner's Guide to Qigong, he said there's three levels of breathing. The first level is to breathe softly so that the person next to you does not hear your breathing. The second level is to breathe softly so you do not hear your breathing. 
And the third level is to breathe softly so you do not feel your breathing. Mm. He is not telling people to breathe more because intuitively he knows that breathing more is harmful. Breathing more is the stress response. Well, if breathing more is the stress response, why are we doing it as part of Western yoga traditions? Yeah. It's because the people who are teaching breathing exercises, and again, I'm not, this could be controversial when I'm saying that, and the people who are teaching it haven't been trained in the basic physiology of breathing, the importance of breathing through the nose and the importance of breathing light. Beautiful. Yeah, what you're saying is, is fascinating because you're, you're saying that uh, things can work in both directions. In other words, um, you know, if, if you think of how you breathe in, in a stress response, um, yes. like for example, let's say in the context of intense exercise, you're going to be breathing very, very hard. Yes. And so what you're saying is if you intentionally just at rest, breathe very hard, you will send your body into that kind of state of sympathetic dominance fight or yes. flight, more stress physiology, stress breathing patterns, and, yes. and vice versa. If you look at meditation, how you breathe in a deeply relaxed, calm state, it's very, very light breathing. And you're saying yes. if you just consciously breathe that way, you will shift your physiology more in that direction. Yes. And recently, um, scientists at Stanford Medical School, they discovered that there's a pacemaker in the brain. We all know about the pacemaker in the heart. It, it, it's, you know, as, as an electrical conduit. But the pacemaker in the brain is activated through our breathing. If we breathe faster, we agitate the brain. And if we breathe slowly, we bring a sense of calm and anxiety. Sorry, <laughs> we bring a sense of calm and tranquility. <laughs> so if we bring, breathe faster, we bring, bring on, you know, that stress response. So we need to do the opposite. And for people, just Google it, Slow Breathing, Stanford Medical School. It was published in March of 2017. Mm. So a couple things I want to ask you in this context. Um, what do you think of resistance breathing devices? You know, for example, I'll show you one of my little tools here. This thing goes in your mouth, and then I'm sure you've seen these before. Yes. Um, what do you think of those? And, you know, one of the challenges with them is obviously that they're mouth breathing. Yes. Uh, but I'm wondering if you perceive them as having benefits or not being a good idea. Yes, I think they're good. Um, the diaphragm is prone to fatigue and physical training doesn't increase or improve muscle of the diaphragm or intercostal muscles. So physical training doesn't increase your, or improve your breathing muscles. Um, the only sport that may increase and improve respiratory muscle strength is swimming. Mm. All other sports, not going to do it. You know, if you really wanted to, to kind of increase respiratory muscle strength, you'd have to increase it such a high intensity, but you wouldn't be able to sustain it for a long time. Now, the only thing that I would say negatively about that device is it's a mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. Whereas... I want to target the diaphragm. You'll actually target the diaphragm when you breathe through your nose. You don't target the diaphragm when you're breathing through your mouth. So what that's doing is bringing the air mainly up into the upper parts of the lungs, whereas actual fact the main breathing muscle is in the lower lobes, mm -hmm. the diaphragm. So in order then to activate the diaphragm, you have to breathe more. But by breathing more, then you can be disturbing blood gases. Breath holding will also target, and the main muscles to target in improving respiratory muscle strength is the inspiratory muscles. Because when you look at the breath, the inspiration is the act of breathing and the expiration is the passive part. So the main muscles that get tired are the inspiratory muscles. Now during intense physical exercise, yes, it is both active. The inspiration and the expiration is active. But generally the main muscles to target are going to be inspiration. The purpose of a device like that is to breathe against resistance so you add an extra load onto the breathing muscles and the theory is then to strengthen them. You could also do breath holding. Mm -hmm. You could breathe in, breathe out, hold your nose, walk around your kitchen. As you hold your breath, the breathing center in the brain will notice that there's a change in blood gases. It will continually send a message to the breathing muscles to breathe. The breathing muscles will continue to contract, contract but you've stopped breathing. So in other words, you're contracting the muscles while not resuming breathing. And that will also improve respiratory muscle strength. But yeah, they're good. They're good. Okay. 
Interesting. So uh, one other thing, a couple of the things I want to ask you about, actually. One is mm -hmm. in, uh, in certain traditions of yoga and Kundalini yoga in particular, there's something that they do called fire breathing. Yes. And, and it can actually, it could be done through the nose, but it's very fast, very forceful in, out, in, out, in, out sort of yes. breathing. And, yes. and when I do that, I definitely feel a, a burning in what I think is my diaphragm muscles. I feel like yes. it's really exercising the diaphragm strongly. I'm, and and even though that's very fast, forceful breathing, I'm wondering if as a as something done for just a few minutes as an exercise to maybe work those muscles, yes. it might be yes. beneficial. Yes. It, it, you know, if you're just doing it for a few minutes in terms of hyperventilation, it's not going to do any long-term damage. Okay. Um, the fire breath will activate the respiratory muscles, include, of course, the diaphragm. But could you do the fire breath with breathing so subtle breaths Mm -hmm. very fast breathing targeting the diaphragm but without the risk of over breathing mm. so you could still get the benefits of it and minimize the risk but short-term over breathing um it doesn't do any harm it's what i'm looking what i'm interested in is how are you breathing 24 7 how are you breathing walking down the street how are you breathing at rest how are you breathing during your sleep how are you breathing working on a computer how are you breathing driving your car that's more important than what you're doing during the couple of minutes when you're taking, you know, the fire breath or whatever. Right. Um, okay. Next question is, um, there was an article on science-based medicine, a, a blog that the guy who, who runs that blog wrote, that was a critique of Buteco breathing and kind of, yes. he was trying to de debunk Buteco breathing. And, and I have to say that, that I read the blog and I actually became skeptical of Buteco yes. and some of the claims around it. Um, but after that, I actually, you know, after I was already skeptical of it, I decided to pick up your book and read your book. Uh, yes. and I just started practicing the exercises and I have to say that for me, um, it was just proven. Like I, I just, regardless of any theories or any, you know, type of ideas around these different breathing yes. practices and what they do, I experienced the results firsthand. And I, I also, yes. you know, I was, we were going against the placebo effect because I already came into it skeptical. Uh, yes. and, and so the benefits for me were just overwhelming that I've become a big advocate of this. And I've also since uh, discovered uh, a lot of research, especially out of Russia, around intermittent hypoxic training. And there's yes. a whole body of evidence around that that, that really impressed me. Um, yes. and, and so anyway, I would just love your thoughts on sort of some of the, the critiques of Buteco. Yes. Yeah, you know, in terms of, you know, the science out there, carbon dioxide can be controversial. Um, it's a, we see people who are, you know, they're showing symptoms of hyperventilation, but yet they can show end tidal CO2, which is normal. Um, you've got other people with, you know, excessive breathlessness, and they seem to show end tidal CO2 as normal. Carbon dioxide is just one of those gases, and doctors don't like the whole premise of carbon dioxide. Now, when Buteco put his theory together, it was put together in the 1960s, and the, the available science at the time was primarily CO2. Now, in saying that, carbon dioxide still serves the same functions as a vasodilator, as, you know, it's based on the Bohr effect, which was discovered in 1904, in that the release of oxygen from the hemoglobin is dependent on CO2, etc. We can develop dysfunctional breathing patterns, and the science is often difficult to connect the science with the experience. Mm. And it could be that the human body is so complex that we don't know for sure what's going on. You know, in terms of asthma, the Buteco method has, has had 17 clinical trials. One of the clinical trials said, and this was published in a medical journal, and it said, if this was a drug, it would be widely available. Mm. But they also said in the papers that the precise mechanism is unknown mm -hmm. because even if we were to just isolate it for asthma, the theories that are commonly used for asthma is that over-breathing will cause cooling and drying out of the airway walls. And basically, moisture is sucked from the airways because of over-breathing, or during physical exercise, you breathe harder, you're taking more air into your lungs, moisture gets sucked out of the airways, and the airways constrict in response to that. Now, that theory is more plausible. Whereas the carbon dioxide theory, which Buteco would say, is that the individual was breathing too much, they were losing carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide relaxes the smooth muscle embedded in the airways, 
and the loss of CO2 was causing the airways to constrict. It's the same thing that's happening, but looking at it from a different scientific perspective. Is it the carbon dioxide causing the airways to constrict? Or is it cooling and dehydration of the airways that's causing the airways to constrict? It doesn't matter. The, mm. the thing is that over-breathing is causing the airways to constrict. What's exactly happening from a clinical or sci sorry, from a scientific point of view it needs to be found out. The main thing is works. So, yeah, and I think in some ways the debate around science, people have hotly debated the theory, but they haven't put it into practice. And it's like this. If I was told, you know, here's a PhD on how an apple tastes, well, I would sooner taste the apple than read the PhD because there's more, there's more experiencing from the tasting of it. And there's no, you know, the first principle of medicine, first do no harm. What harm is there in terms of switching to nose breathing and slowing and softening the breath? Mm -hmm. No harm and huge potential. And, you know, this was debated since 1871. American physician called the Costa. He came back. He was an American physician during the, the American Civil War. I hope I have my date correct there. But he noticed that soldiers returning from war, they had fatigue, they had breathlessness, and they took such a long time to recover. And he called it, the, it was called the Costa Syndrome. For his natural fact, it wasn't until 1937 that it was called hyperventilation syndrome. And Claude Lum, then in the 1960s, he wrote more about hyperventilation. You know, so this thing has been around. Hyperventilation and excessive breathing, chronic overbreathing, it has been documented for over, you know, 100 years. And yet, even though it's estimated that it affects up to 10% of patients who are visiting general practitioners in the United States, 10%, a lot of people, yet it's not getting any attention. Yeah. And it just makes sense. You know, what could be more normal than breathing through the nose and breathing lightly? And until we start getting a greater awareness out there, there's not going to be research because I'll give you a story. I, we have done research on the nose with a university here in Ireland. And the great professor there, who was very open-minded, and he had seen the results over a period of seven years, his patients he's seen making progress. And I remember him telling the junior doctor, he said, you know, your colleagues are going to poo-poo you for getting involved in this research because it's too simple and it's not sexy enough. And that's why scientifically as well, we haven't evolved because doctors are, you know, there's a lot of peer pressure for doctors to remain within that certain circumference and not to go outside it. And breathing is outside it. Well, I think it's time to bring breathing into conventional management and not to have it out on the, on the extremes. Beautiful. Yeah, well said. Um, you know, one, one thing I just remembered that I wanted to ask you about that I spaced out uh, sure. is breath holds with air exhaled versus holding the breath in yes um, and huge, this is huge this is, difference this is something that i, I myself am confused about as far as what exactly the differences are and i okay. haven't i haven't been able to find anywhere where it's clearly explained but most of your practices seem to be about exhaling and then and then holding yes so why um, is that i explained it in the book because i think it's a very interesting thing breath holding has been used in sports since the 1980s, but actual fact, probably going back a lot longer than that, Councilman was a very famous swimming coach and he used to instruct his, his athletes, his swimmers, to breathe in and hold. And he called it hypoxic training. Now, if you breathe in and hold, you won't drop your SpO2. It's not hypoxic. But okay, you will. And, and for, for people listening, that's your blood oxygen level. Yes, yeah, so you're not, going to, you're not going to lower your, your blood oxygen saturation to below, say, 91%. When you breathe in and hold, you increase carbon dioxide. So it's called a hypercapnic response, high CO2. But it would be normal oxygen. Mm. Now, the benefits from threefold of doing a breath hold after an exhalation. One is, as you hold your nose, nitric oxide sharply pools inside the nasal cavity. When you release your nose, you have to breathe in. And all the nitric oxide that's been accumulated, you're carrying that into your lungs that's going to pass into the blood. It sterilizes the air. It assists with ventilation perfusion. It's a bronchodilator, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the benefits of the exhale whole technique is 
you get increased accumulation of nitric oxide. The second effect is you get a hypoxic effect. When you exhale hold, you will drop your SpO2. Your, you will drop your oxygen saturation in the blood. This is intermittent hypoxic training, without a shadow of a doubt. I've used this with hundreds of people using their you know, pulse oximetry. It's very easy to determine if you're lowering your blood oxygen saturation. Buy a good quality pulse oximeter, put it on your finger. There's a little infrared light there that detects if hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen. And you will be able to lower your SpO2 to simulate a height of about 12 to 14,000 feet in about three to four days of practice. Easily done, takes a bit of work, but it's doable. You also get a hypercapnic response. So there's more going on if you exhale hold. There's less going on if you breathe in and hold. Okay. So in terms of the blood gases, it's a far stronger effect by having a normal breath in, normal breath out and hold. It's much stronger and it's more beneficial than breathing in and holding. Okay. Now, if in terms of carbon dioxide levels, if you breathe in and hold, do the do carbon dioxide levels get higher than they would if yes. you were to ex Okay. Do you, no, so do you think... No, oh, we wouldn't. Don't. No. They will, okay. sorry. They will increase, but I wouldn't expect them because you would expect a higher carbon dioxide from the exhale hold technique because the CO2 okay. now that's coming from the blood into the lungs is not going to be you know, diluted because there's, there's only a residual volume of air left in the lungs. Okay. So there's literally no, no aspect of it that's superior with holding in. No, you're okay. better off just so much better. Breathe in, breathe out, and hold. Okay, awesome. Well, this has been absolutely wonderful. So so insightful, and it's been a pleasure to to have you on the show. And you're I'm a huge welcome. advocate of your work. Um, on a personal note, you mentioned altitude just now and and intermittent hypoxic training. I have yes. to say that uh, I've been I was practicing your methods for about six weeks prior to doing a, a recent trip where I was doing a lot of hiking at high altitude. And I was the only one who didn't, uh, didn't get altitude sick and, didn't, right. uh, and, and, and was just hiking at high altitude without really feeling the ill effects from yes. it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, for sure, I think that you can mimic altitude you know, yes. quite, quite easily just with some of these breath hold practices. Um, yes. And, yes. You know, and, and as I mentioned before, I just want to recap that I've also experienced increased energy, increased work capacity in the gym, lower perceived effort, um, mm -hmm. less time, recovery time in between sets. I mean, um, I'm just a huge advocate of this and I've, I've experienced the benefits in my life personally. So, um, Great. well, thank you so much, Patrick. It's been an absolute pleasure. Great. Thank you, Ari. All right. Take care. Bye. Hey, this is Ari again. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Patrick McCowan. And just a quick reminder, after we recorded this episode, Patrick and I ended up partnering and doing a program together called Breathing for Energy. This is a special program featuring his content and my content as it relates to the science of breathing and a whole set of systematic practices and programs, both from him. We've got three tracks from him for people with chronic fatigue, people with sleep issues, and people with anxiety issues. And then there's a whole other main program in there that is a systematic progressive program, which centers around uh, progressive intermittent hypoxic training, uh, taking you all the way up from about 15 second breath holds, uh, that's the sort of the lowest level, all the way up to basically Navy SEAL, Navy SEAL levels of like four minute breath holds and beyond. It goes just beyond my current capacity, uh, which is near four minutes. And it is a phenomenal program. It's in fact our best selling program and the one that we hear the most raving feedback about how it has transformed people's lives. I mean, genuinely transformed their lives uh, by massively reducing their anxiety and stress levels and increasing their energy levels. Uh, I've heard many, many people report doubling their energy levels in a matter of four or six weeks of doing these practices. It is really powerful stuff. I highly, highly encourage you to check this out if you are either interested in increasing your energy levels or decreasing your anxiety and stress levels. So you can find the link to that down below this video if you're watching on YouTube, or you can go to theenergyblueprint.com and click on programs and you will find it there. So thank you again for watching and I will see you again next week.